Welcome to Talking Talk Therapy with Ascend Counseling and Wellness. I'm your host, Trevor Thompson. We have an episode of Meet the Therapist today. So we have one of our newest therapists, Dustin Hodgkin, on. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Trevor. So we're just going to get to know him a little bit, do some personal touch, some all your deepest, darkest secrets. I love sharing those. And then we'll kind of dive into like a little bit about what you do, your modalities, what your clientele look like. Perfect. Um, you know, how long you've been practicing, that kind of thing. So... All right. So tell us about yourself. Who are you? Where are you from? Well, I am coming up on 40 years old. I was born in England. My father was in the Air Force. And uh, we left when I was about two, came back to the States. Both my parents are Californians. Uh, Spent most of my formative years in Houston, Texas, though. Okay. Yeah, so we got transported there. And and then I left Texas and spent... Uh, over a decade in the Pacific Northwest and recently moved our family here to the desert of southern Utah. <laughs> Especially right now, you can definitely refer to it as the desert yeah. because I think we hit like 116 the other day. Yeah. It, it was brutal. It's, it was hot. It seems like it might be chilling out a little yeah. bit, but the mornings are a little bit cooler. Wait till November and mm-hmm. you'll love it. Yeah. We've done two and a half years here and um, I was always told that the wet cold is colder than the dry cold. Yeah. But the dry cold of the desert, it's pretty cold. <laughs> so It's true. Still got my puffies from Western Washington. So you got your wife, you got kids? I do. We have two boys. They're 11 and 10 years old. Cool. Yeah. That's Boys are, boys are a handful. The apple of our eye. They're great. <laughs> yeah. So how long have you been practicing? S- I started practicing uh, over 10 years ago. Okay. In Washington State, Western Washington. That's where I completed my graduate schooling in Seattle. Okay. So mostly been in private practice, but I've worked in uh, the public school system as a counselor. I've worked with military families on um, military installations. Okay. I've worked in community mental health as well, but mostly outpatient private practice. Did you feel drawn to that? Um, maybe some of those military families because of you know your your dad's background and your family's background. Yeah, I think so, uh, to, to a degree, because he definitely wasn't a career lifer in the military. But I'll never forget in high school dressing up in his, his blues uh, yeah. for like a school spirit week. And I was in his full uniform and with the hat on and everything. And it was uh, so a, a part of being a military kid. They talk about being a, a, a sunflower or a dandelion. Dandelions can grow anywhere. They're yeah. considered a weed, right? But these kids, they go through a lot, moving all over the place. So yeah, I think a part of me did resonate That's working cool. with those families for sure. I I, I have the utmost respect for those that, that yeah. serve for us for sure. Mm-hmm. So here in Southern Utah, two and a half years. Yeah, uh, now now here with us at Ascend. What's what's like your typical demographic or your niche? You know, like every therapist has sure. certain specialties. Yeah. Um, a, a mentor of mine told me years ago. He said, uh, "You gotta, you gotta try and specialize. Find what you really can do your best work at." He said, "Don't, don't be a jack of all trades, because you'll be a master of none." <laughs> so I, I think I knew from the beginning when I discovered this profession that I really wanted to figure out how can you really help couples mm-hmm. have a thriving relationship. So I've definitely focused most of my clinical practice and all of my training and certifications on couples therapy. Okay. Yeah. So one thing I've noticed with most therapists, Mm -hmm. um, and it it seems like yourself included, and we can talk a little bit more about this right now, um, is they're always trying to educate themselves more. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's continuation credits that are required. Yeah. But I see a lot of our therapists and just in general therapist be very selfless and how can I better serve my clients Mm -hmm. whether that's you know do I need to go to a workshop do I need to educate myself more you know do I need to learn different modalities Mm -hmm. Um, it seems like you know from what I know and and we want to educate everybody else that's watching that you've you've done that and so do you want to you want to share a little bit about you know some of the different training models that you've you've learned and modalities that you use yeah so what I have found in my growth as a therapist is um, usually what I'm seeing in the room um, with my clients needs it's like, oh, wow, this is something that I need to understand more about. So let me see, either seek it out in supervision or with mentoring with other colleagues who are seasoned or, you know, going to figure out what conference I need to attend. Um, that's really happened for me in my career around 
personality disorders. Okay. Most of the general public is kind of aware of narcissism. Everybody likes to accuse each other of being narcissists and Karens and Kevins on the road. Right. Um, but that that research and that literature has really only been around since the 70s and 80s, personality disorder uh, research. So narcissistic personality disorder, uh, histrionic personality disorder, not a whole lot of people have heard of. Uh, borderline personality disorder, you're hearing, you're hearing more about that. So when I started to see people struggling with these kinds of uh, presenting issues, I, uh, de- I pursued certifications in those. Okay. Um, so I also, there are literally, this is, here's a fun little fact that I learned at a conference, a couples conference, uh, probably five years ago. There are literally over a thousand theories in the field of psychotherapy and there are 400 manualized organized methodologies of talk therapy. Wow. That's a lot to choose from <laughs> as a provider, but also the consumer yeah. who wants the best results and they want them sooner than later. Right. So um, it can be overwhelming for the provider of the service, but also for the consumer. Okay. So I know your, your specialties couples, it seems like, you know, from what I've, I've kind of gained knowledge of you. You, you could see really anyone, mm-hmm. um, you know, whether it's an individual struggling in their marriage yep. or both couples coming in and working on skills together. Mm-hmm. Um, what a, what approach or modality modality do you use yeah. when, when approaching couples? For sure. Sometimes uh, my clients will come into my office and they're like, we heard about cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah. We want that. Or we heard about... EMDR. I'm dealing with trauma. I want EMDR. Yeah. Um, uh, another model that's been around for quite some time, and I started studying it as an undergrad, was uh, Gottman couples yeah. therapy. And they were right there in my backyard in Seattle where I was doing grad school. So studied a lot of Gottman, done a lot of training with the Gottmans, John and Julie Gottman. Uh, w- the theory that I was most passionate about uh, when I was first starting is called emotionally focused couples therapy. Yeah. Um, it's really heavily focused on attachment theory. Uh, so I practiced and studied and went to conferences to try and cultivate more proficiency in, in that model. But then about f- six years ago, I discovered a whole new model I'd never heard of called relational life therapy. Okay. And it's developed by a family therapist by the name of Terry Real. So I bought every book mm-hmm. he's ever written. Uh, his first book is entitled... Um, I don't want to talk about it. (laughs) Overcoming the secret legacy of male depression. So specifically on how depression presents in men because it looks very different than how it presents for most women. Uh, He has another book entitled uh, How Do I Get Through to You? It's more focused on couples. His next book was The New Rules of Marriage. Great book. And then his most recent book is entitled Us. So I read every book and then about two years ago I started a, a certification program in relational life therapy and it has not only has it transformed my own my own marriage and my own relationships with my children and with my family members it's absolutely transformed the way that I approach working with couples and it's I've seen it help uh, my clients faster and more lasting change okay. so it's been it's really been inspiring that's awesome mm-hmm. and so I mean how many how many couples and this might be too broad of a, of a question, but how many couples do you see that just struggle because they are so rooted with their own insecurities? Yeah, um, there's a lot to be insecure about. Yeah. This day and age with you know internet and social media, we're constantly being exposed to opportunities to compare ourselves to others. Yeah. So there's a ton of that. Um, so every client, to yeah. some degree or another, we call it we call it a self-esteem disorder. Yeah. Really, the industry of psychotherapy is focused a ton on uh, the kind of the more shame-based depression, anxiety, perseverating, worrying. Mm-hmm. But the field hasn't done a whole lot, um, some would argue, in focusing on the inflated higher self-esteem, so people who are egotistical or self-absorbed. So that's kind of the spectrum that I see in my office is the, the low end and the high end. Got you. Yeah. It just seems like, you know, a lot of people really struggle with, I can't even feel how much you love me because mm-hmm. I don't really love myself. Sure. I, I feel, I look in the mirror and I just don't, 
I don't enjoy what I'm looking at. So how mm-hmm. could you ever enjoy what I'm looking at? Mm-hmm. And I feel like these couples forget, like, I'm still wildly attracted to you. I st- sure. Like, I'm still with you for a reason. I still want you for a reason. Mm-hmm. But, again, you're so guarded with your vulnerabilities and just feeling mm-hmm. so insecure that you almost don't even feel any of that. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, you know, then neglect happens and withdrawing happens. Sure. And you know, we see that happen anyways. It's a great description. And, and then one, you know, one day your, your kids leave the house and you're like, we were mom and dad and mm-hmm. interrupting husband and wife. Mm-hmm. Now mm-hmm. what? The empty nester stage can be really challenging for a lot right. of couples. So that's what we call a, a perspective that I have as a couples therapist is uh, we call that empathic reversal. Mm-hmm. If someone is struggling with their own, their own esteem for themselves, yeah. they have, have contempt for their lacking but they're expecting their intimate partner to make up for that. The, what I have learned is that no one can reparent that wounded part of us. Yeah. It's our responsibility. Mm-hmm. Putting that on our children or putting that on our spouse or uh, our, our parents already messed us up enough. Now <laughs> it's on us to reparent that wounded part of ourselves. Yeah. Um, so that's something that makes a big difference because most of the time it's women who feel responsible our wives feel responsible for nurturing and loving loving to death the parts of us as husbands that we're insecure about yeah but it usually is becomes a perpetual problem until we man or woman learns how to heal that wounded part i i think that you know there's obviously a lot of people that don't have the insight and and self-awareness to understand that there even is a problem yeah but i do think that there's like an accountability piece like you're saying of like yeah I experienced this mm-hmm. that doesn't mean my kids have to experience this or sure. you know I watched divorce but that doesn't mean I have to experience yeah. divorce and so having that insight to go mm-hmm. I want to break that cycle you know you mm-hmm. always hear people say break break the cycle mm-hmm. you know like don't pass it on to your kids because then they're going to pass it on sure and so I think a big piece of that comes from some accountability and then first recognizing that was a problem yeah but the tricky part is, you know, how do I emotionally navigate through that? Mm-hmm. And that's why I've always said, like, come to therapy. Mm. It, it's not because you're crazy. It's not because you have to have this diagnose that, diagnosis that seems daunting. Yeah. Like, it literally can just be, I need some skills. Mm-hmm. I want to be better than what I experienced. I, mm-hmm. I need some parenting styles. I need to, have to learn how to be a better spouse. Sure. And, and it doesn't have to be, you know, years of therapy. Mm-hmm. It's just coming in and getting some tools and then implementing them. Yeah. The, what you described as far as passing that, what we call it transgenerational trauma. Yeah. What we learn from our parents and what, what we're repeating in our own families and then what we're passing to our own children. We describe it as relational recovery. Similar to any kind of substance abuse or a behavioral addiction, uh, when it comes to the kind of recovery that I focus on in my practice with couples and families, is it's kind of like a, a forest fire analogy, mm-hmm. which we, we've got a lot of those this time of year. <laughs> you can see these just big plume smokes yeah. uh, out in the desert. Um, so relational recovery is a great analogy that my mentor taught me is it's kind of like a forest fire. And it's as if the people that I work with are stopping and facing the flames of that consuming transgenerational trauma uh, of the harm or the neglect yeah. and they're saying kind of like Gandalf you shall not pass <laughs> you shall not pass and so it, it can take uh, it can take some time yeah um, but it doesn't have to take forever it really just depends on where people are at and how how much they really want to transform their life it's very brave work yeah tremendously brave yeah I mean especially if, you know maybe some guys that have some deep-rooted vulnerabilities that they don't want to they don't want to expose, you know, yeah. and, and I get that. And, and that goes for anybody. It's like, I don't want to share these insecurities mm-hmm. and be vulnerable with somebody that I don't know. Mm-hmm. And that's why I've always said that therapist client relationship is so valuable. Yes. Like if you can connect with somebody, like I, I love people that educate themselves, but sometimes just that personable mm-hmm. relationship seems like it's more important than anything. Yeah. Yeah. My uh, great colleague of mine, he says, some some helping professionals they have the mind of a helper uh, but they lack the heart yeah. they lack the ability to connect with people so you have to have a heart and a mind yeah. um, and some of those are absolutely learnable whether you're a helping professional or whether you're a parent or, or a, a partner 
having that heart and mind to be um, successful in relationships can be learned. Yeah. So that's 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 what we've seen in my in my experience. I love that. Yeah. So I, I ask every therapist I bring on here this question, mm-hmm. and it's it's there. There's no right or wrong answer. Okay. It's just your opinion as a provider. Okay. So if there is someone out there that is on the fence about coming to therapy, they're hesitant about it. Yeah. What would be your your piece of advice for somebody like that? Yeah, um, that ambivalence to even start the process is something that's really important to, to validate. Yeah. Because if it's going to really work, um, dipping your toe in the water won't get the results. Right. Um, really diving into the deep end is going to make a bigger difference. Um, so if for those for those people who are like, I don't know if talk therapy is for me, I don't, I don't believe in it, I don't think it works, maybe you're right. I think that's really important to, to recognize, to not promise the world. Um, it might not be the thing for you. Maybe go and summoning uh, Mount Everest is going to lead to lasting change, but yeah. sometimes um, not everybody can do that. So finding a therapist who's the right fit sometimes can take kind of shopping multiple times, mm-hmm. but some oftentimes it ends up being um, worth the effort yeah. rather than just staying miserable or suffering yeah. and taking it to the grave. And we all deserve to be happy, right? Sure. And if, and if that's the key. And I love that you you mentioned, like, maybe it's not for you. Yeah. Like, the, we're not saying we're a one-stop shop. And that's that's what I love about this company is we're so systemic. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like we, we can genetic test. We mm-hmm. can do medication evaluations. We can do lab work. Mm-hmm. We can check your blood work. Like, it's not like the therapy component is going to solve everything. Yep. But our therapists are like, let's look at this from every possible angle that we can Mm -hmm. because we want you to feel better physically emotionally and so i that's that's why i love you know that we have the systemic approach and i love that you said hey maybe it's not absolutely yeah that's foundational that we call it the uh the framework that we describe it in the mental health industry is that biopsychosocial spiritual Mm -hmm. model you're taking a look at that systemic lens um so there's a lot to consider when it comes to pursuing happiness that's awesome well Appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks, Trevor. Hopefully everybody enjoyed the episode. If you're interested in booking with Dustin, he's got openings right now. So just go ahead and call the front desk. I'll attach a number to the episode, and you guys can call and get scheduled and do a consult. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon.